there you go. We're recording now. And I'm Sandra Arevalo. I'm the Director of Community Health and Wellness at Montefiore Nyack Hospital. Happy to be with you once again, as every Thursday at 12 p.m., talking about one important topic for your health. So for all of our participants, thank you for being here today. Thank you to all people who registered and wasn't able to make it, but could be seeing the recording, recording uh, very soon. So today we're going to be talking about strokes. I think that strokes is one of those words that when you hear, you kind of shiver a little because you don't wanna have one, you don't wanna meet anyone who has one. So today we're going to be talking extensively about strokes, what they are, how are they formed or how come one person can end up with a stroke more most importantly how to prevent them and in the event you ever had one how to prevent um serious complications of strokes and all of that and what we need to do to prevent serious complications so today we have two outstanding people that work on this very hard every single day trying to keep everybody safe and i'm gonna let them introduce yourself learn themselves so they are from our neurology team here at montefiore nyack and they're gonna also be doing a brief introduction first before we move to the q and a portion of our webinar and what i ask from all of our attendees as i do every week is please abuse us with questions. So we love questions. We love that you use the Q box or the chat box. Just, you know, not every day you have the opportunity to ask all the questions you like about an interesting topic. So this is your opportunity. Please take advantage. I will be reading all your questions to our presenters for today. So without further ado, please. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Dr. Arian. I am the director of stroke here at Montefiore Nyack. And I am Darren Murray. I am the um, stroke outcomes manager here at Montefiore Nyack. Um, I'm a nurse uh, and uh, I've been a nurse for 15 years and I got into stroke through stroke intervention. So I, I used to work in um, a stroke intervention lab. That's kind of where my passion for stroke and neurology started. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation, but uh, I think stroke is an amazing disease process because it's very preventable and it's, it's very, within a, that first window of time, it's very reversible. So I really love what I do and I, I love taking care of these patients. So, so. Thank you. Good. Dr. Aaron, how did you end up uh, working with the strokes? Well, originally I did my training in Georgia, and then I came back here because I'm from this area. And when I was in Georgia, I was very, um, I liked the stroke metrics. So when I came here, I kind of fit into it, and then just kind of melded it all together. And the coordination, and the directorship, and the metrics, and making sure that it was a high quality. So it just kind of came all together. Hmm, look at that. Okay, and how long have you been in the field? So I, boy, uh, I graduated in high school 2011. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it's a while. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I think uh, you should be able to share your screen right now. Okay. All right. I'm just going to get started. I just have a quick presentation. One second. There we go. Can you see that? We do. All right. So I just wanted to really quickly um, just a broad overview of what stroke is, the different types of stroke, and what tests may be run and what interventions are available for strokes. Um, so the basics, basically. Um, so what is a stroke? Um, a stroke, we like to call it a brain attack um, because that kind of puts the urgency in care for stroke. Um, it occurs when uh, the blood supply in the brain is cut off one way or another. Um, it's ischemic strokes uh, is a type of stroke where 
um, something is inside the blood vessel that's cutting off blood flow into the brain. So that's either plaque that's built up in the blood vessel or a clot that has broken off from somewhere else in the body and traveled up into the brain and into the smaller vessels and then cut off blood flow into different parts of the brain, which then causes disability. Um, or you have a hemorrhagic stroke, um, which is caused by a blood vessel uh, in or near the brain um, rupturing, which results in bleeding within or over the surface of the brain. It disrupts the blood flow um, into different parts of the brain, and then it can also cause intracranial pressure as well, um, which harms the brain. Uh, stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, and it is the number one cause of disability, long-term disability in the United States as well. Uh, so just going back to kind of those different stroke types so that you know what you may hear um, when people are talking about strokes. So um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of mini strokes. Um, the official term for that is a transient ischemic attack or a TIA. And that's basically a brief stroke-like attack where symptoms re resolve usually within 24 hours. Um, it can cause weakness or paralysis on one side of the body or the other, slurred speech, visual disturbances, loss of coordination, dizziness. Um, it's more commonly found in males than females. Um, if there's a family history of TIAs, it will increase the likelihood that it could happen to you. Um, and it can be a precursor to um, a cerebrovascular accident. Um, actually, one third of those patients eventually do have a stroke, and then half of that usually typically occurs within a year. Um, so cerebral vascular accident is uh, CVA, and that's what we were talking about earlier, that ischemic stroke, when the blood supply of, to the brain is reduced or blocked. Um, and what happens is basically brain tissue starts to die off, and that causes temporary or permanent damage to the areas um, of the body where that part of the brain controls. Um, so if it's a part of, um, if it's like the part of your brain that controls your speech, um, it will make speaking difficult or aphasia. Um, it could cause paralysis to one or both sides of the body, um, confusion, uh, headaches, visual disturbances, difficulty swallowing, and difficulty walking. Um, the other type, intracerebral hemorrhage, is something else that you may hear, um, or ICH, so that's the, the that hemorrhagic stroke. Um, a lot of times that's caused by um, increased blood pressure, um, weakened vessels, um, or, or aneurysm. Um, people have heard of, of, you know, you hear of celebrities who've died of a ruptured aneurysm. And, and an aneurysm is basically like a little bubble in your blood vessel. Um, and that's a weakened wall. And uh, when you have kind of a combination of that weakened area and high blood pressure, it could cause a rupture and then bleeding in the brain. Um, or, or it could be caused by brain trauma. Um, and the treatment options for that usually um, surgical and then some kind of medication to lower your blood pressure. Um, signs and symptoms of that uh, ICH, the intracerebral hemorrhage, are um, severe headaches. Um, you may have the same thing as a, um, as a CVA where you have weakness on one side of your body or the other, uh, decreased level of consciousness, neck stiffness, um, uh, vomiting, seizures, a balance loss, dizziness, swallowing, confusion as well, right? So, so what happens when you have a stroke? So it's very important that you get to the hospital as soon as possible so that a couple of things can happen. We can do imaging to see what's causing your stroke symptoms, um, and that imaging is uh, Typically, a CAT scan of your brain, because that will show us, um, is it an ischemic event or is it a hemorrhagic event? Um, and then if the CAT scan is inconclusive or it may not show anything, but you're still showing signs and symptoms, then you may end up having an MRI, which just kind of gives um, a deeper look at the brain. Um, medication, or I'm sorry, uh, blood work is also something else that we do. Uh, we're going to do some sort of like coagulation study. Um, because if you're on anticoagulation medica medication, such as um, uh, aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, things like that, uh, we want to make sure that if we give you anything to break up the clots in your brain, 
you're not going to bleed any more than you would have. Um, we also want to know what your platelets are. Um, we're going to do a, a metabolic panel because we want to know, um, are there any other issues going on with any of your other organs? Um, and then a lipid panel because if it is cholesterol, if it's that plaque buildup in your vessels that's causing the stroke, we want to know what kind of all of your cholesterol levels are so that that can be treated long term. And then you can expect someone to be doing um, some kind of a neuro exam on you. So uh, the doctor may ask you to repeat a phrase or they're going to want to see how your eyes track or uh, have you squeeze their hands or push against you with their feet just to see if there's any kind of weakness more on one side of the body than the other. Okay. Um, so, so what are the treatment options for stroke? Um, uh, medication, that uh, is one of the things that we can do. Um, clot dissolving medications are available, um, and that we call it TTA. Uh, it's a medication. Um, it's not sponsored or anything like that, but um, if you get to the hospital in time and um, you have all of the appropriate symptoms, and we can give that to you. Um, TPA is a medication that we can give through the IV, um, and it will work on a clot that's blocking the blood flow to the brain very quickly to break that clot up and reestablish blood flow and um, reperfuse that brain tissue um, before any more damage is done. Um, beyond that, long term, after whether you get the, the clot dissolving medication or not, most likely, if you've had a stroke, you're going to end up on some sort of aspirin, Plavix, an anticoagulant like that, and, and it's antithrombotic, too, possibly. Um, also, depending on your um, cholesterol levels, you most likely will end up on a some kind of a statin long-term or, or some kind of cholesterol-lowering medication long-term. Um, if it is a clot that's in your brain, and or plaque that's in your brain and the medication hasn't worked, there are also other options, um, minimally invasive surgical options. So I said, I got into stroke through neurointervention, um, and that is similar to um, you hear of when people have a heart attack and they go to the cardiac cath lab and they have a cath lab procedure um, where basically they send a balloon up into the heart to reopen those vessels. That's kind of what happens in neurointervention. Um, we send a device into the brain to pull out the clot, and that's called thrombectomy. Um, similarly, we can open up vessels, and, and in the pictures here that you see on this slide, that's basically a balloon going into the vessel with, that has plaque blocking it and opening up that vessel to reestablish blood flow into the brain. And then also, what someone who's had a stroke can expect to see is some sort of physical therapy, which is the PT, OT, which is occupational therapy, and SP, which is speech therapy. Um, those therapies are going to help you kind of uh, reestablish um, control of your, of your walking, talking, um, fine motor skills um, for uh, long-term recovery. And then for my last slide, I just I say time is always brain. Time is brain. So think be fast um, for stroke care. So if you're at home and you have sudden balance loss or, or dizziness and you haven't done anything to cause that, um, all of a sudden your eyes become blurry or you have some sort of visual disturbance, um, if one side of your face starts drooping, um, if you start having unexplained numbness or weakness on one side or the other in your arms or legs, or if all of a sudden your speech just becomes difficult and, and you can't get those words out, remember that it's really, really important that you get to the hospital as soon as possible. You want to get to the ER so that we can treat you um, as soon as possible. Uh, a lot of the treatment modalities uh, are time dependent, and the faster you get treatment, um, hopefully the better the outcome will be. Um, you know, time of last known well, usually within 24 hours or less, that will determine whether or not you can have like that thrombectomy or or those procedures to reestablish blood flow into the brain. And that that's really it. I guess from there we just whatever questions anyone has can answer and I'll stop sharing my screen so Sandra can have it back.
Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. That was great. And we already have uh, one question there, and then I have a million others. So the question is, let me let me look at it. Um, can forgetting words be a sign of impending stroke? The short answer is yes. Um, like we said, if it's an acute onset, like all of a sudden you're talking and then suddenly I, 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 that, or you start messing up with words, uh, I know what I want to say, that, yeah, that goes back to be fast, call 901 coming off. So just the fact that you have um, that type of change in your speech alone, it's significant enough to run to the hospital? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. wow, that's great. Now, you also mentioned a headache a few times, but you know, there are a few of us who suffer from migraines and all of that. So is there any type of difference between, you know, a severe headache type of migraine headache and a headache that is, you know, a sign of something more severe as a TIA? So I, I think a headache by itself, unless it's, if you have the worst headache of your life, if it's the worst headache of your life, you feel like thunder goes off in your head, come to the ER immediately. If you have a regular mild headache and you have any of these symptoms, mm. that the numbness, the speech, the vision, uh, the dizziness, you should come to be evaluated. Now, migraines is different because usually if somebody knows they have migraines, they have certain symptoms that they experience with their headaches regularly. Mm -hmm. But if this is a first time event, come to the hospital. Okay. Hmm. And we have another question here. Could we see the B fast slide again? Oh, sure. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice question. <laughs> uh, and while you pull it up, it's another question. How does what you eat affect stroke prevention? Okay, so we'll, we'll look at the slide first and then I'll answer. Right. Let me just get there really quick. There, there's the BFAST slide again. You can see that, right? Yes, we do. And then you want to leave it up? I don't know if there's going to be another question about it. But in the meantime, um, so the, the, the next question was, how does what, what, how does what you eat affect stroke prevention? So in diet, the big things we see, so uh, when we have the slides up for the tests we do, one of them was lipid panel. So lipid panel is checking your cholesterol. Um, the other one is the metabolic panel that checks glucose. So risk factors for strokes are high cholesterol, diabetes. Um, that's just to keep it very, um, not getting into too much complexity, but diabetes and high cholesterol risk factors. So it's high blood pressure. High blood pressure can come from high sodium. High sodium is from high salt. Mm -hmm. So diet makes a difference. If you're eating high salt, very fried foods, fatty foods, high sugar, candy, soda, it's a risk factor. Okay. And how long does it take for the loss of nerves in the face after a stroke take to get back to normal? Okay. Tricky question. Everybody's different. So generally speaking, we like to think that once we have an answer of how you got the stroke and we put you on treatment, rehab is the next thing. Everybody's different. How much you're going to get back to normal? Some people do well, some people don't. It depends on age. Sean, one thousand and one. We are a hospital, just saying. We're <laughs> <laughs> we are a hospital after all. <laughs> um, but it depends. It depends on the pre existing conditions. It depends how severe the stroke is. It depends on the location. 
It depends on what we're, we're you know, is this somebody who's, you know, 25 years old or somebody who's 85 years old? So there's other things. It's not just a one-time answer. Mm -hmm. I will say the faster, again, it comes back down to like the faster you get treated, a lot of times that makes that makes a difference in the recovery. Mm -hmm. And another question posted here is, how common is a stroke in children and adolescents? What do you mean, how, how come they have them? Yeah, like, like I guess, what's the prevalence uh, for the strokes in children and adolescents? I don't have specific numbers, but you can have stroke in children and adolescents. There's other factors that play into that. Genetics, um, if they have bleeding disorders, um, if they have sickle cell anemia, um, they have trauma, uh, they have hereditary, like some younger patients under, well, younger will say it's under 18, might have high cholesterol genetics or they might have high blood pressure or a heart condition. So there's risk factors that can allow for children and teenagers to have stroke. The prevalence, I don't have numbers to give. We'd have to come back to that later. Um, one of our attendees says, my mom worked, at, worked as an IV therapist at NIAC for 28 years. I think having these Zoom sessions is fantastic. Thank you, Mary. That's oh, nice. <laughs> um, how can we identify when somebody's having a stroke? You know, Ma like Mary just mentioned mothers. So for example, if, if I'm having dinner with my mother one day and something starts getting weird, right? Like, how uh, do I know? Be fast. That, yeah, that be fast, that's be the fast. best way. Any I mean, loss of balance, any dizziness, any change in vision, any change of facial strength, any change in uh, arm or leg strength weakness, any change in speech or numbness, one side, all I want. Yep. Are there any symptoms that can be confused with a stroke? So for example, I don't know, maybe, are there any, could we be feeling something and thinking I'm having a stroke, but it's not a stroke? I guess that's what I'm asking. So it, these, okay, so these symptoms can be other things. Like you can get dizzy if you have vertigo mm -hmm. or if you didn't eat all day or if you're tired or if you have a heart condition. Your eyes can get blurry if you have cataracts or if you have, um, you've been sitting at the screen too long or if you have migraine. So the symptoms can be something else, but the way we're addressing it is better safe than sorry especially because if it is a stroke or a TIA, mm -hmm. the faster you come, the faster we can treat you. If you come later and it is a stroke or TIA, the, the, the treatment is, we're limited now. We don't have everything we can do for you. Um, Are there any patients um, or circumstances in which symptoms of a stroke cannot be identified? Uh, what do you mean? Like somebody might be having a stroke and it's not showing, you know, oh, the, the yeah. symptoms. Yeah, you can have silent strokes. Hmm. So silent strokes are where, you know, there's a good number of patients we have. We will get like a CAT scan or MRI for something else. And it'll say old, small stroke, small. See, so with the brain, you have to remember location matters. You can have a small injury in a really important spot and be paralyzed. You can have a large injury in an area that's not doing too much and you never know your whole life. Mm -hmm. So it is possible. But the idea is you wouldn't know. You should be getting checkups with your primary care. And there's certain checkup labs they do, blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol. If you're smoking, stop. These are all risk factors to reduce that a stroke could happen. And most of these reductions also have to do with the heart, not to deviate too much. Right. So the heart and the brain are pretty closely linked. Mm -hmm. That's a scary. <laughs> That's true. 
That's but there's also there's also silent truck pain. There's also there's other. That's why it's. it's um, I think unfortunately a lot of people like to think like, okay, this happened, I'll fix it. And it's more like no, 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 no. This has to have been, you know, it's like a car. You don't say, oh, it's a flat tire, change it now. It's like, okay, but did you drive safe? Did you see the nails? Did you were you paying attention when you were driving? You can hopefully fix it now, but you might cause damage to the car long term, and that's it. The body's the same, but you can't change your body. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I want to fix it that day. There needs to be constant taking care of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, maintenance. and we have another question. Do you recommend seniors taking low dose aspirin every day as a preventive measure? It depends on the patient. Do what I say, just take it for just take it and and so nothing happens. It depends on you. It, you know, if you're depends on age, it depends on your other conditions. Some patients are allergic to aspirin. Some patients have a bleeding issue they don't know about. Once again, I would talk to your primary care. And we have an interesting comment here. Uh, Dory says, one time I was going to a conference and all of a sudden I forgot why I was packing. That was a sign. Could be a sign. Um, would I get that checked out? Yes. Mm -hmm. It sounds like she remembered after. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a much shorter question, but surely important. How can high blood pressure affect a stroke? So, okay, let's go back. So it might have <laughs> You're picturing it in your brain. <laughs> so high blood pressure, think of it like um, think of it like the the pipe in the kitchen for the sink. Okay. When you have a brand new pipe, it's normal, the water goes through, it gets to where it needs to go. When you turn on the faucet, everything works. Okay. As we get older, high blood pressure makes those pipes stiff. Sean, 1,000, please, for the lab. Sean, 1,000. The water might not be able to get all the way through, or the pipes might become dead. Environmental services to room 10, please. Environmental mm -hmm. services to room 10. Same thing as the brain. When the blood can't get through the blood vessels easily, you can get a stroke. If they're too stiff, they might bleed, and the blood doesn't get to where it goes. We call that a hemorrhagic stroke. If the blood can't get there because the pipe isn't strong enough, it's going, but it's going slow, that'll cause an ischemic stroke. So blood pressure matters because it is determining how the blood is getting from heart to brain. It's not getting there enough, you're not going to get enough, and it's going to stroke. So managing high blood pressure is important. Mm -hmm. You know, while, I, while you're saying that, I'm thinking of a host. Or, you know, like sometimes after they're very old, instead of being elastic that they can't move, you're gonna move them and they break all of a sudden. Is that something similar? That yeah. is similar, similar. Okay, yeah. Now here is another question. How can this be prevented? So this goes back to what saying. Um, diet, exercise, routine healthcare, no smoking, uh, follow the primary care. Primary care will be good for, you know, this is what we need to tune up. You know, let's do these labs, let's we'll check your pressure, let's see what we need to fix, let's see what you need to take care of. So primary care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, there was another question about the same thing. How do I prevent this? Okay, so let's say, unfortunately, we have a stroke or somebody had a stroke. What are the consequences and, and you know, what does it need to get well again? Eka, 1,000 plans for the last. Okay. So first thing is, you come in, we examine, we do our workup. Let's assume it's a proven stroke. Okay, so we'll start with that. It's a proven stroke. The next thing now is going to be rehab. First of all, what is injured? If you tell me somebody who is numb on one side, or they're permanently weak, or they can't talk well, so the body will try to re, the body will try to rewire it. Like if this part is injured, it'll say, okay, this connects over here from now on. This connects over here. 
So the body itself, the brain itself, will try to correct as much as possible in the first two weeks. So you might notice the patient might start to get a little bit worse, a little bit better, a little bit worse, a little bit better. But in two weeks, you'll see if they're getting better or worse. And that will become the new normal. From there, rehab starts. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. And that's going to be now to try to get the body to get to work again. Because you're kind of starting from the bottom. They get to as much as you can. Will you get back to 100%? Very rare. Because there is some damage, but there's a struggle. Can you get to 95? Mm -hmm. Six, nine, you can. It depends on the patient. It depends on the size of the stroke. It depends on how severe the injury. It also depends on what was done. Like if you came, say, within an hour and we gave TPA and the doctor is able to pull the clot out, well, that helps a lot more. Depends. So is there treatment? Yes. Is there hope? Yes. It just depends on what is going on at the time. And uh, you just spoke about therapy. How long does it take to be co to come back to that 95 or 98? I think at some point you say it depends on each patient. So the, we like to think within, by one year, what you are is what you are, right? The first three to six months, I would say 70% of the magic. That's where you're going to see, are you doing better or not? By six months, you have an idea of where, you, where you're going to be. Can you make small improvements after maybe another 10, 15? Yeah. And by one year, this is what it is. You're talking about different different kinds of damage. And I, and I think you've said that it depends on where in your brain that is. So can you can you explain that a little bit better or just expand on that a little? Like what will damage sure. what? So okay. So when we when we evaluate the patient, we have a scoring system for stress. Okay, it's called the NIHSS. That gives us an indication of how severe the stroke. Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? So let's say, for example, we'll say arm. Okay, let's say the patient's arm. Okay, can I do I have full power? or am I completely paralyzed? That's a big difference. If I'm starting off completely paralyzed, how much can I get back? Like for, for someone who goes from zero, mm -hmm. from 100, an improvement would be at least 50%. An improvement would be anything over zero. If you tell me before I was fully, you know, I had full power here, but now when I put my arm up, I can't, I can't keep it for too long. Okay, so an improvement is gonna be, can you hold it up by yourself? Can you grip? Can you write? Can you eat? So that, I know it's a bit of a, not a straight answer. It, 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 it really does depend on the patient. If you're completely paralyzed on one side, what's an improvement? Well, an improvement is you being able to move. Are you going to be able to go jogging? Not likely. But once again, it depends. What did we do for you? If we did nothing for you, if you waited five days at home and then came in, it's going to be difficult to help. If you came in immediately, you have a much higher percentage of improvement. So it depends also on the person. It's not all going to be the same. If you have, if you tell me a patient comes in, you know, I was at home eating dinner and all of a sudden my arm got weak and my leg got weak and, you know, my, my sister called 911 and they came in immediately and they gave them CPA. Yet this person has a higher chance of getting more improvement. We have someone who says, I was afraid to come in. I thought it was nothing. Every day I started getting worse for five days. And I don't have much to help. Like we can still do rehab. We can still look to see how it happened, but the damage might be harder to fix now because we didn't have that treatment or management. That's why it's important from the slide, be fast, I am. The faster you come, the better it is for you. Mm -hmm. And Mary says, don't drive. Please call 911. Absolutely. Yeah, Especially if you're feeling weak, how are you going to get in that car and drive? Absolutely. Exactly. How often do you need to check with a doctor after you have a stroke? Sean, 1001, oh, wow. for Hazel, yeah, in the lab. Sean, 1001. Um, there's no set time, but usually it's after you leave the hospital, two to three weeks, a month, 
three, six, and then a year. That's a good time frame, depending on, on the patient. Um, some patients say, hey, I'm doing good. I'll come see us for physical therapy. Okay. Some patients say, no, I want to come more often. It depends. But a good, a good scale is two to three weeks, one month, three months, six months, one month. Mm -hmm. That's a good, at least, uh, frame to you for a patient. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people who hate taking medications. After a stroke, are there any medications that people need to take and they need to take for the rest of their life, which is what people hate? So, depends. Let's, um, I'm just thinking about medications. Usually, you get put on a cholesterol medicine. Okay. Usually, they get at least an aspirin. Some patients have lifelong blood thinners, anticoagulation, like you might see on the news, uh, Coumadin, Warfarin, Zeralto, uh, and that's usually if you have a heart issue. Lydia, 1,000, please. Okay. Lydia, 1,000 for so pharmacy. Yeah, if there's a heart pause that's causing a stroke, you probably aren't going to be like, mom. Um, if the patient is diabetic, then they're probably going to be on medication. I mean, more, more likely than not, you probably are going to be on medication for the rest okay. of your life. But if you're not, you're going to be at risk of another stroke. So, pros versus cons. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. You just said you can have a stroke after a stroke. So, it's not like a one time deal. No, but if you're not taking the medication, mm -hmm. you're most likely. Most I mean, just think of it. If, you, if the patient had a stroke without proper medication or care and they leave, we didn't fix anything, it's probably going to happen again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is your body trying to tell you something is wrong and you don't want to take the medication to fix it? Yep. Mm -hmm. What would be a plan to have at home in case someone is having a stroke emergency? Call my own. There's nothing to do at home, it's call 911. Make sure I you have batteries on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a actually, you know what? If you have a family member, call 911 is the best thing. But they're probably going to ask you questions. So important things you should know. Are they allergic to anything? What medications are they on? Mm -hmm. Any recent surgeries? Um, what medical problems do they have? Because that's the questions we're going to ask, which determines what we can do for you. If you're allergic to, say, aspirin, we don't know that. That might cause a problem. Mm -hmm. If they take uh, blood spinners at home and, you know, why? Well, they have a heart condition. Are they still taking it? No, he stopped or she stopped. It gives us, it helps us to give you faster care. So call 911, but be prepared. You're going to get asked questions. Allergies, any surgeries, medical problems, and the most important, what medications are they on? Because mm -hmm. we can figure out when we see the medications, what medical history they have. Mm -hmm. And I love this question. It says, as a family member, how can we assist when the person is a stillborn? For example, lack of self-care to prevent. They don't want to take their medications. They don't want to take care of themselves. They don't want to go to the doctor. We've had, we all have one like that in our family. Yes, <laughs> yes we do. Love that question. <laughs> I think education, like yeah. like sharing with them. Sometimes, you know, tough love is, is kind of like showing, well, this is what could happen to you, like, if you're not taking your medications. And, you know, everybody has access to YouTube, and there's lots of stories, yeah. like other patient stories out there. Like, that sometimes is the best way to get someone's attention and say, you know, look at what happened to this person. This could happen to you if you're not taking your medication. Or can, doing what you're doing. Yeah, and, can, and and this question is kind of related to that, and I'll get to that back in a minute, but can you die from a stroke? Most of the time we hear about people, you know, who say, oh, I had a stroke and I'm paralyzed outside, whatever, but can you die? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah. We can tell people, hey, you want to die? If, if the stroke is large enough, what happens is it causes too much pressure on the brain, and then 
shuts down and everything shuts down so they die so yeah if a stroke is large enough it can kill mm -hmm. well i have to say as a health educator yes i encounter at least one patient like that a day and i i agree i think that um, education is key, but it's also showing the consequences of what can happen. I usually tell my patients who have had a stroke or are at risk of having a stroke, it's like, okay, you want to be independent, you want to take care of yourself, but if you end up with a stroke, you're going to have to need somebody to even bring you to the bathroom, shower you, and clean you. Is that what you want? You know, so when you put things in that perspective, how severe they can get and how it can change your life completely to the extent that it's going to be the opposite of what you're looking for. I think that people start thinking about it. Some of them do, some of them definitely don't, but that can help sometimes. Okay, we've had a nice uh, amount of questions here. And I don't know if you have any final thoughts or anything else that you would like to share with our attendees or if our attendees have any last minute questions. Oh, you're on mute. I, I do have one question. I'm part of, I, asked, I attend those stroke committee meetings. I think they are great. And I think that it's, um, you know, very informative for other people to know all the work that you do in behind every patient with a stroke. So maybe we can close with that and you would like to share, you know, everything that we do, you know, with the code purpose and all of that so that we can do the best we can for our patients and make sure that they have a good quality of life even after so Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, we can kind of like take you through a, a day in the life. <laughs> so a stroke patient comes into the ER and they're showing signs and symptoms of stroke and they meet the criteria for what we call a code purple. Code purple is a stroke alert. It's basically alerting all of the individuals, the stakeholders that we like to call them in the hospital that we have a patient here, they've had stroke symptoms, they are still in a window of treatment that we can do something about it. So we call this... Um, code purple. Um, they're going to have the imaging done, so CAT scan gets involved. The radiologist reads the CAT scan um, very quickly. Um, the neurologist comes, assesses the patient, um, works very closely with the ED physician and the ED nurses um, to get that neuro assessment done. Do they meet the criteria to get those clot-busting drugs? Do they, do they not? What else are we going to do for the patient? Now the PCA, I think um, we're ready, KG, in room one, please. The the diagnostics are done. Um, <coughs> then we either give the medication or we don't give the medication. Um, depending on what's happening with the patient, they may get admitted into the hospital. Um, to our, We have a neuro unit that's that's specific for those stroke patients and the nurses on that unit and in our critical care units are specially trained to take care of those patients. Um, and that's where, you know, the, the appropriate post-stroke medications are ordered. Um, that lipid panel that we talked about looking at cholesterol levels is done. Um, the, the cholesterol lowering medication is given, anticoagulants are given, antithrombotics are given. Um, and then physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy comes and sees the patient while they're here in the hospital. You know, they're seen daily by the neurologist. Um, the hospitalist takes care of them while they're in the hospital. It's a, it's a huge group of people caring for this patient during, throughout the stay 1,000, please, transportation. on the phone for you. Sure, 1,000, transportation. And then once they're ready for discharge, they may go home or they may go to a rehab facility, depending on how severe the stroke is. Um, and what effect it's had on them. Um, or instead of being admitted, they may be transferred um, to um, a facility where they can have those uh, more intense surgical procedures that we may not do here, um, that thrombectomy, um, that type of, of procedure to get those clots out. And then it's kind of the same thing from there. They're gonna be admitted into the hospital, into critical care um, and, and do everything that they can do to get them back on their feet up to that 95% or whatever is they're capable of before they go to rehab or home. 
You're on mute again. <laughs> and I have to mute myself because of the AC that comes up and then it, it makes a horrible <laughs> sound. But um, yes, thank you for saying that and for sharing that because I know that there is a lot of work that you guys all do after every stroke patient just to make sure and ensure the safety of that patient. Let me tell you, this team rocks, really does. And what you just said has uh, sparked another question. What is the difference between an anticoagulant and antithrombotic? So an antithrombotic is, um, I'm, a, I'm assuming the question is antiplatelet versus anticoagulant. It's just antithrombotic. So I'm gonna say antiplatelet. Yeah, <laughs> so really. Antiplatelet is like aspirin and plavix. These medications, They're not full blood thinners. I misheard. I misheard. Okay. Antiplatelet versus anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is a medication that'll make the blood thinner and smoother. If you cut yourself or you hurt yourself, you might bleed faster and longer. Okay. Antiplatelet medication is meant to keep the blood going smooth, but it's not as strong. Not as strong. So if I had to put them like this, okay, antiplatelet medication is around here. Anticoagulation is around here for stress. Antiplatelet you can buy from ShopRite or anywhere over the counter. Baby aspirin or Plavix 75 is small. Blood anticoagulation you can only get by prescription. Mm -hmm. And they are very heavy duty. Um, I think the best thing going back to pipes. Antiplatelet is like putting hot water down the drain to kind of clean it. Anticoagulation is putting like two drains. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. You know, and, and I just have another question uh, because I hear that a lot of people, we hear that aspirin is very good for you, you know, and a lot of people, and you that's something that you can find actually over the counter since you're mentioning medications over the counter so is it a good practice if i'm if i'm a healthy person i'm not overweight or anything to start taking like a baby aspirin a day without a prescription that's primary care it depends it depends so that's your primary care yeah so you should never take anything without a prescription without talking to your doctor first you should talk to your doctor because you don't know what else is going on. Things might interact you don't know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so please don't start anything without consulting first. And to piggyback on that question, what about taking omega-3s? Uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some studies that show it helps. There's some studies that show it doesn't help. Once again, it depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. So it would, go, it would go back to your primary care. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you tell me the patient, like if you ask me, hey, should I take uh, aspirin every day? Uh, you know, I had a ischemic stroke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you tell me I'm 25 years old, I, I, I run track and I play tennis, I don't have any medical problems. Should you take aspirin? No. Mm -hmm. It depends. Omega-3, it depends how old are you, what medical problems do you have? What has happened to you in the past? What allergies? So it's a question of the primary care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So lesson number one, see your doctor. Lesson number two, be fast. If you yeah. see any of those symptoms, what's your plan? 911, call 911, run, help that person, help yourself. Don't drive yourself. Mm -hmm. Call 911, correct? Okay. So thank you very much to all of our attendees. Great questions today. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Aaron and Darren for being here. You guys are great. Again, I admire your team very much for all the hard work that you do every day. And you know, just, just make sure that if, hopefully you never, but in the event that you or some family member has a stroke, we have a great, team here that is going to be able to take care of you or your loved one who are on top of everything possible to help you be well as fast as possible. You are the one who needs to run. Once you get to the hospital, you leave the patient in the doctor's hands and they're going to be the best they can for your loved one or for yourself. 
Next week, we're going to be talking about resources for patients with cancer. There are a lot of things out there. Sadly, a lot of people have cancer and cancer is not only a disease that affects only one individual, it affects the whole family. And we're going to be talking about all the resources that are out there for the patient, for the family members, for everyone to help you uh, live better while you're fighting that terrible disease. So I'll see you again uh, next Thursday at 12 p.m. And hopefully I'll see you very soon as well, Dr. Aaron Murray. And um, thank you for being here. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good one.